All right, hopefully everybody can hear me now, see me. Apologies for the um, late start there. We were having some issues with my audio. I'm gonna share my screen. Second. Looks like we have some people coming in, so I'm gonna wait just one second before I actually start getting into my content. And we're actually gonna skip a lot of this. I just wanna pull up uh, a couple slides that I have inside here. All right, so thank you everybody for joining. Um, I'm John. I'm going to be giving a quick look at some of our products and how they relate to API design um, and kind of the validation of an API. So hopefully everybody here um, has had the chance to attend um, the session by my colleague, Ali, where she talked a bit about um, the API. And, and her thesis in her presentation was that it's not just just it right, but did we build the right thing? Did we actually did what came out of our implementation? Is it the thing that we actually needed? Does it actually solve the problems for our consumers and our customers? So what we're going to look at today is some smart pair tools and uh, specifically how those tools help with the design process. Um, so we'll be looking at our tool Swagger Hub, if anybody's familiar with it. And we're also going to look a little bit at some of the validation that we can do uh, with some of our other tools, SOAP UI and Service V. And what I'm really trying to do there is inspire some ideas. So, and again, we will be looking at smart bear tools, um, but if you're not using smart bear tools, these are concepts that you can take and use with different tools uh, that you may already have inside your tool chain. So this is a PowerPoint I'm repurposing. And really the thing that I want to get to in here We'll skip all this. Well, actually, we'll, maybe we'll talk about this just a little bit. There is. Let's go back here. Um, so we have a whole portfolio of products. We've been around since 2009. Uh, we're a pretty quickly growing company. We have just under 1,000 employees now. Um, number of open source projects that we contribute to. And all of our tools are focused around um, basically quality in some shape or form, whether it's performing automated testing, uh, quality from a design perspective, quality from a code review perspective, monitoring when you're in production, right? All of our products are involved with uh, quality in some, some way. Um, but we're gonna skip over this slide. And really what I want to talk about today, uh, what we'll be looking at is, like I said, the design process and how we can use Swagger Hub specifically in that design workflow. I just wanna to touch on the alternative to a design first workflow. Um, so contrast that to the code first workflow. Uh, so I'll show this slide and then a slide on design first. But if we're not doing design, what our workflow looks like is maybe, we know we need to add a feature to our API. We need to provide different types of data or um, you know, maybe add a new endpoint or something like that. And what we do is we sit down, hands on the keyboard, start coding, implementing something, write some tests, put it into production, document after that and hope it works, right? Um, so we call this the code first workflow and there's some pros and cons to it. Pros are it's much quicker, right? Um, or can be maybe much quicker. The perception of it is, is that. Uh, but on the con side, it's, it's tough for us to really understand if we're actually solving the problems for our consumers that we are intending to solve. And that's because we have either a very, very, very brief or isolated design process. And it's not something that's collaborative um, and, and really focused on the problems and the solutions. And that's what we're trying to solve with the design first workflow. We'll just go through all these animations here. So in a design first workflow, what we're doing our first step before we implement anything is to talk about what it is that we actually want to build. And as we'll see, um, and I'll talk about a little bit later, create some examples of really how our users could be interacting with our API. And this, this workflow, I like this image here because it's showing um, Swagger Hub. It's also showing some of the testing tools that we'll be looking at today uh, with SOAP UI um, as well as Service V. 
but it's like creating a sketch before we actually go and build um, a UI or something like that. So again, the goal is to have this design phase, talk about what are we actually, what problems are we trying to solve, and then go and build, um, build our changes and use the documentation that we built in the design phase as a contract to build to. So that's what we're looking at in Swagger Hub. I'm gonna get out of get out of PowerPoint now. And by the way, there's a uh, Q and A chat on the side. If anybody has any questions, I'll, I'll be keeping my eye on that. And um, let me get rid of this inception over here. Pull that up. Cool. Uh, so I'll periodically go and check that. Uh, if you have any questions there, you know, please feel free to ask them. Hopefully, everybody. The audio quality is okay. If, if it's tough to hear me and need to slow down, speak louder, you know, please let me know and I can uh, adjust if possible. Cool. Um, so again, three tools we're gonna look at today, Swagger Hub, Service V, and Ready API. We're going to start with Swagger Hub. And, um, and again, this is our tool for API design. So there's a few key features in Swagger Hub that are going to help in the design process. So right now I'm in the editor. And this is where the bulk of the design process happens within the tool. Um, within the editor itself, we have, obviously, in the middle here, the actual editor. This is where I'm going to be inputting my API design right, using YAML. On the left-hand side over here, have a navigator. We also have some options for switching around the editor. And then on the right-hand side, we have a live rendering of our documentation. So this will help if we're trying to design also from a usability point of view uh, in terms of, of the actual documentation. We can see what our consumers will be seeing. So now in Swagger Hub, the, the workflow looks like I come to Swagger Hub as a designer. I want to make my change. Um, we create a space to make that change. Then we implement whatever it is that we're trying to implement. Swagger Hub is going to give us some feedback. We respond to that feedback. We then add collaborators so they can give us their feedback from you know, humans versus a kind of more automated approach. And then we go off and build. So a few key things there. And the first thing I want to talk about is versioning. And now versioning is pretty straightforward in terms of uh, maintaining a history of your API. But the, the meaning of versioning and the usage of versioning changes a little bit when we talk about that from a design perspective. Because how we're using this is instead of being our I guess, like I said, history of all the uh, versions that have been in production. This is also a lot like how we use uh, feature branching in Gitflow to isolate our changes for the design. And this is the example I always point out when I'm showing people Swagger Hub. And I apologize, my computer's been very buggy lately. And obviously with the reduction in staff and offices and stuff like that, people working from home, it's Tough to get the tech support people to look at things. Um, so if it lags, I apologize. But so I have this version here where I, I've appended a JIRA work item number, right? And what I'm trying to show here is how if I have some changes that I need to make for some work that I'm doing, JIRA story or JIRA tasks, task, I'm going to isolate those using using my versioning, and then I'll go through and go through that iterative design process. So let's switch to that version. And the reason I want to switch to this version that, is because it shows off the next thing that I want to highlight within Swagger Hub. So the, the big things that Swagger Hub are going to do, right? Um, what it's focusing on is collaboration and governance. That's how that's its approach to the design process. And the um, one aspect of collaboration is can be thought, version can be thought of one aspect of collaboration, right? creating a new version, I'm using that, like I said, to isolate my changes in the same way that Gitflow is collaboration around source code. Um, but what I want to talk about here is the first time we'll see governance. And one thing that Swagger Hub is doing for me is as a designer, as I'm making changes, it's running the validator in the background. And of course the validator is going to be looking for, um, you know, syntactual issues, right? Is this valid OAS or Swagger that I'm writing in here? But the other thing that it's looking for um, is this concept of standardization, right? So let's say I'm a 
I'm working in a larger organization. We have lots of teams who are building APIs. I may need to um, use the API from a different team. We may also have an architecture type role, somebody who is looking at the overall structure of our application and saying, these are the design patterns I want my APIs to abide by so that it's easier for any individual developer to start using an API from another development team, right? There's, there's less um, cognitive load around learning that API because it will follow patterns that they're already familiar with. So enforcing these design patterns uh, can be a challenge for a lot of organizations. It can be oftentimes manual for those architecture type folks to go through and manually review these API definitions and saying, yes, you did abide by our architectural standards or no, you didn't. Um, where Spider Hub comes into play is trying to make that a little bit easier. So one thing built into um, Spider Hub itself, like I said, is the validator. And you're able to extend the validator to enforce those standardization rules. And that's what I'm trying to highlight down here with this orange arrow, where you can see I'm being told that I must include a 200 response. So as a designer, I'm seeing that right away and I can make these changes while it's still early. One of the big things we're trying to do in the design process is to make the cost of fixing things a lot cheaper, right? The, the more I do, the more I implement, um, the more I build, the more expensive it is to fix things. It's just like building a house, right? If I already have all my walls up, my drywall up, and I have to change piping, I have to pull all that down, go through the changes and then put everything back up, right? It's easier to do that when I don't have my walls set up already, right? Same thing with, you know, development. And um, what these rules will do is help, like I said, the designers see that right away. It's also helping the people who fill the architecture role. A lot of the people we talk to on the phone are architects. Uh, it helps them enforce those rules in a much easier, frictionless way, right? They don't have to go through and manually review these things now. Um, so this is just one example. This must include 200 response. Um, I always like to show where the rules come from. By the way, this is the Swagger Hub home screen. So the two main screens in Swagger Hub, one's the editor, we're just in the editor, and this is the home screen. Think of this as the place where I go to find APIs, discovery. Um, so it's a big list of APIs here in the center. Uh, I can search it, and I can also create these tags. They're actually called projects, but the I like to think of them as tags. Uh, that will help me group APIs and find them if I need to access them. Let's go into our settings and just look how the standardization works. By the way, we have a GitHub repo that we just put out that has a bunch of examples of different standardization rules that our customers are using. So if you're wondering, where do I start with this? Maybe your team is just starting to think about like these style guides or standardization I'm not sure where to go. It's a great resource to kind of look at and see what are other people in the space doing. So these checkboxes that I'm kind of going over pretty quickly, these here, these are some pre-built rules. They're very basic rules. But at the bottom is where we can extend uh, the validator to have our custom rules. So here's my 200 response that I highlighted. I show this here. And basically, it allows you to um, create these rules by pairing up a expression that says, this is where you look in the API definition. And then this is a regular expression that you apply. This is what I'm looking for. right? So you combine these two things, and you have a custom rule. So it can be really powerful, really helpful, um, like I said, to extend the validator and make it easier for designers to incorporate these standards into their design process very easily, and also for the architecture people to create these standards and then enforce them in an automated way. And by the way, uh, you know, in real life, we talk about these design first workflows versus code first workflows. The reality of it is a lot of organizations are still working in a code first way, even though they may. Um, aspire to be design first. They're, the reality of it is they still are code first. Um, nice thing about the standardization is you can programmatically get access to that. So you can incorporate Swagger Hub into your CI. And even if you're doing code first, you can still, let's say, upload a definition to Swagger Hub, just get back the response that has validation passed or failed in it. 
and you know cancel a deployment or something like that based on that. So we can still incorporate it um, into the code first workflow. All right, well, let's we're back in the editor now. And actually, you know what? Let me check for questions there. All right, looks like no questions. So we'll go back to get out of the uh, tunnel there. All right, so um, back in the editor here. Again, what we just looked at was the first piece of standardization, uh, this, this idea of governance that Swagger Hub is helping us with in the design process. Um, the next piece of governance, before we hop into collaboration, uh, the next piece of governance is this idea of creating reusable components. So go back to the example, I'm in a large organization. Let's pretend that this inventory management API is part of a, a larger um, e-commerce store and there may be multiple APIs that are all dealing with the same inventory item object that needs to pass around in my domain. Um, how do I create? How do I create that so or ensure that all of the APIs that my various dev teams are building are using that same schema for that inventory item? And that's where this idea of reusable components within the world of Swagger Hub, which conveniently are also called domains, um, come into play. So from a designer's point of view, I'm going to think of these like Lego building blocks. And actually, you can already see I'm using one here. Let me reset this. Start typing inventory. I don't know if anybody caught that, but there was an H that was put into when I was typing inventory. It's actually a symptom of my laptop seems to be malfunctioning in a way where it's inputting random keys as I type. Um, fun fact. So I'm a designer, like I said, I'm coming to my editor. And again, I want to use this inventory item schema now. Like I said, one of my options, I can define this locally, right? And I have to rely on uh, my own knowledge of the inventory item to make sure that I'm defining that same schema that all the other APIs are using. Or I could use this reusable component, this domain, and reference that here. So you can see I have my local ref, but I have this domain reference that I can use instead of that. And domains are assets that live within Swagger Hub, just like API definitions. They're snippets of an API. And if I go to look at this domain, you can see that. We can also see what we can use this for beyond just schemas. But what I'll be able to do in an organization is create a library of these domains. And now my developers, my designers, have this library of building blocks that they can use to implement their API or implement their design, um, create their API definitions. So here's my schema down here for inventory item. Like I said, you can go beyond just schemas, headers, parameters, path items, right? So there's a lot that you can do with these to again, build those building blocks. And it all falls under this theme of governance because what it helps you do is create this, these standardized components. So you can agree on, this is what an inventory item looks like. And now you can make it easy for people to abide by that uh, ag agreed upon definition of that item. All right, and I'll check again for questions. That's reloading. Cool. So we have a question. I'm sure everybody can see since I'm sharing my screen. Um, On-prem version of Swagger Hub that can be integrated to third-party API lifecycle management solutions. So we do have an on-premise version. There's two deployment options for Swagger Hub. One's to use the SaaS version. It's actually what I'm demoing from right now. The other is to use an on-prem version. They're almost exactly the same tool. The only difference between SaaS and on-prem, uh, beyond the fact that uh, you would be hosting on-prem yourself, is that it allows for custom code gen templates that you can upload. And it also has this concept of multiple organizations. We haven't talked about organizations yet. Maybe uh, if we have some time, I'll, I'll loop back and talk about that. Uh, but basically, it gives you additional ways to organize your list of APIs. But otherwise, exactly the same tool. And the deployment options for on-prem are as a VM or through the AWS Marketplace or the Azure Marketplace. All 
All right, so coming back to the editor, we just talked about the governance pieces of Swagger Hub. The next thing that I want to look at is, or the next kind of category I want to revisit, like I said, Swagger Hub is a collaboration and governance tool. So let's go back to the collaboration piece of the tool. Once my trackpad catches up, we'll navigate over to my sharing menu. I wish everybody could see. See what I'm trying to do. With, it's just not navigating. Um, all right, we'll use a verbal description until my until my laptop catches up. So next to export, to the left of export, we have four circles. We have a little document looking icon, the gear for settings. We have the little blue bell. That's for notifications. Right now I'm subscribed to this API, which means I'm going to receive notifications on updates and new versions and uh, publish events and things like that. But the fourth icon, the fourth circle closest to the word export in the top right-hand corner, that's where I'm going to share this API with other collaborators. So why would I want to do that? Again, part of this whole process of design before we build is to help solve that problem of, am I building the right thing? Uh, and a great way to do that is to pull in the people who will be using it, or maybe pull in the people who are looking at the big picture, architects, those types of roles, and ask that question to them, does this design solve your problems? So by sharing the API design, oops, almost had it, that's going to let me easily get that feedback from those people. And all that feedback can be collected right here in the editor. Which I think my laptop will let me show you. All right. Maybe not, I spoke too soon. I really apologize for this. This started having the issues yesterday and I even went into my office to see if I can get IT to look at it, but unfortunately they weren't in. Um, so maybe we can again use these verbal cues. We'll look back in the center of the screen where we have the editor and there's the line numbers on the left-hand side next to my YAML. And if I can draw your attention to line 74 where it says responses on the right, and then if we look to the left, there's a little blue icon with a number numerical one inside it. And you can see in that same vertical column, above and below that blue icon with number one, we have pluses. This is how I'm going to leave comments in the editor. Oh, maybe it's back. So that's going to let me do is if I have a piece of feedback, hey, uh, you know, that 400 response, uh, needs to include some information. The 200 response needs to include some information. Um, so I can collect that feedback and then actually respond to it. And an important piece of the feedback is that um, keeping track of what's been addressed, what has not been addressed, so you can resolve comment threads. It's all real-time feedback. So if somebody comes into the tool and um, leave some feedback and a designer is also in the tool. They'll see that, they can respond to it. What I wanted to show in that menu of share and collaborate is the different levels of access you can grant people to the API definition. And this is important for collaboration, again, especially in a large organization where you do have to worry about um, you know, access patterns and who can access things and participate in designs and you know, you may have people with good intentions who come into something thinking it's the right thing and then they change something and they shouldn't have changed it, right? So protecting yourself against those types of situations. Um, from that menu, you can grant people just view permissions or give them the ability to view and comment but not edit, or you can give them full permissions to or full access to edit the API, comment on the API, and view the API. So you do have that granularity for those who are um, looking for that type of access control. I really apologize about this. I don't know if my 
mouse, the, the jerky movements it's making across the screen are coming through in the screen share, but. Not, not the as interactive demo as I was hope, hoping to give here. <laughs> so I appreciate everybody having some patience. There we go. We have a new comment here. Now another piece of collaboration, and assuming my computer cooperates, we'll look into uh, Ready API to see this in a little bit more detail. But another piece of collaboration is the um, mocking server that's built into Swagger Hub. Now it is a pretty basic mock, um, but the, the goal of it is, and for those who aren't familiar with what, what mocking is, uh, it's basically creating a dummy version of my API before I build it. Right, and there's a lot of tools out there that will do that. We'll look at SmartBear's version of that, but again, that's built into Swagger Hub, and, and the goal is to help facilitate the design process to give you a way to interact with the uh, definition, interact with the API that you plan to build before you actually build anything. Um, and the whole the whole goal of that is to make the cost of changes relatively cheap, right? Because I could I could even connect a client to this mocking endpoint. And I could send a request to it, get a response back, and then I can change my definition, maybe uh, tweak my design a little bit, and that will update my mock. And then I'll see that in my client request and response that I receive um, and, and is theoretically visible in my client. So the, the mock is visible in the UI. If you see in the right-hand side of the screen, uh, where it says servers between my actual documentation and the name of my API, simple inventory API, between that green bar and that header, there's a servers dropdown where it says https vert server.swaggerhub.com. That's my mocking server. And again, Swagger Hub built that for me as soon as I created this API in Swagger Hub. And based on changes in my definition, that's going to update uh, that mock there. You know what, I'm gonna try to I'm gonna try to stop sharing just for a second if I can get my mouse there. And close a few applications to see if that helps out a little bit. So bear with me just one more second, or maybe 10 seconds. This is a real extreme version of the demo effect. <laughs> I don't think I've ever had something this bad. Uh, but hopefully, conceptually, some of these, these things are making sense. Uh, if your teams are thinking about design first, hopefully these are resonating with some of the challenges that you're looking to solve um, with design first. Um, a lot of the teams that are coming to Swire, to uh, talk to us about Swagger Hub, I, again, are kind of in this phased approach where they've started talking about what their design first workflow will look like. Um, again, they're code, currently code first. They probably have a lot of different teams who are doing different things. They're storing their documentation in different repositories. Maybe some are in Git, some are in SharePoint. Uh, we talked to a lot of people who are just emailing around Word documents with a bunch of JSON inside it, right? So if, if that sounds kind of familiar, um, moving to a more centralized design workflow can help alleviate a lot of the problems that you may have associated with those, those other workflows. All right, we're still having some issues here. Now, the next tool that I wanted to look at was SOAP UI and Service V. 
So, like I said, the vert server or the mocking server in Swagger Hub, it, it's a basic mocking server, which means that it just responds with static data. Um, if I send a variety of requests to that service, it's going to respond with the same response every single time. Now, for some teams and for the design process, it's usually enough just to validate, you know, the happy path. What does a 200 response look like? Um, for later in the development process, uh, we may need something that's a little bit more dynamic. Uh, and that's where a tool like Service V, if I can ever show it, <laughs> would um, come into play. Because Service V makes building a more dynamic mocking environment very easy. Uh, it's all graphical. I don't have to code anything out. Uh, it's all point and click. Uh, and I can build it based on an API definition. So a workflow would look like designing in Swagger Hub and then pushing it out or pulling it into um, the Service V editor and then using Service V to add different um, responses, uh, response codes, uh, different examples identify different uh, dispatch patterns. Do I want to respond randomly, sequentially, uh, based on parameters, you know, however you want to do that. And then very easily share that virtual service out so other developers on my team, on different teams can use that. And again, the whole goal is to validate the design and make it make the cost of change as low as possible. Because now we have this interactive service that lets me see the different examples of my um, the interface with my API. And if I have a change that I need to make, it's very easy for me to make that change and say, does that actually meet my criteria or not? Let's see if I can get into Red API. Maybe that will. Sometimes it's weird in Chrome. Uh, just another note. Oh, it's looking promising. Uh, just another note on Swagger Hub. And the question about on prem versus SaaS is making me think of this. Um, there are some built in integrations with Swagger Hub. The two main ones are to your uh, Git repository, so something like GitHub or Bitbucket or GitLab, and then to an API gateway or API management solution. Um, there's also a webhook that you can set up that's event driven based on the save up here at the top of the editor or a publish event you can publish in Swagger Hub. And you could use that to kick off some automation in an external tool. Um, a lot of workflows that I see are the webhook kicks off a CI middleman like Jenkins, and then that does something like take an API definition, put it into another tool, or kick off notifications in something like Slack. So you can build these cool integrated workflows um, using the webhook. And then also Swagger Hub has an API, a registry API that you can use to get things into Swagger Hub. Same thing. Uh, we can use that to build some pretty cool automated workflows that may um, automatically publish something in Swagger Hub or that example I gave earlier about code first, where you have an automated process uploading a definition to Swagger Hub and then asking Swagger Hub if it passed standardization. So just something to keep in mind for Swagger Hub. I really apologize. This is all day working fine until 3:20 in the afternoon when my session starts, and then my laptop decides to give me to give me some issues again. Okay, we may have some progress. Great, okay, looks like it's temporarily back to normal. Hopefully some people stayed on. Um, if, if people had to drop, I would totally not blame you. <laughs> uh, looks like we have no new questions. Let me actually just go back in here really quick, show this collaborate menu. Oh, 
hopefully I didn't jinx it. There we go. Cool. So this is what I was referencing the collaborate menu where we have these different uh, sharing options, right? So you have that granularity and then going back to um, the commenting over here, we'll just show comments. Again, this is tied right to the editor. So it's holding all that feedback right into Swagger Hub. And then over here is where I was referencing the mock server. But given that we don't have a lot of time left, I want to hop into our tool ready API and talk a little bit about virtualization and also talk about contract validation and how you can integrate that into your workflow. Um, so for those who aren't familiar, ready API, it's a platform that does a few different things. One, API functional testing. That's SOAP UI. I've referenced that a few times. Second is API uh, load testing. And then the third is API virtualization. And that's service fee. We'll be looking at service fee and uh, SOAP UI, the, the load testing tool is load UI. But we won't be looking at that today. Um, so let's start with service V. Now, this is where I can build out virtual services. And you can see down here, I have a virtual service running. We're going to use that virtual service to look at contract testing. Um, but this is the designer that I was referencing where I can pull in my definition, my design from Swagger Hub, and then I can start building out something that's interactive that I can use to understand the examples um, of how people may be using our API. And that's something that's really important for any design process is talking about the examples of how people will be using it. Um, popularized by BDD, right? Talking about the different scenarios that people may use to interact with whatever it is we're building, in this case, an API. And just because it's a backend service and API, it doesn't mean that we can um, abandon those same design principles. So let's open up a virtual service just so we can look at how the design works. So we have our same get, post, and delete that we saw in our definition. I'll risk pulling it up again. Hopefully it doesn't freeze my computer. But here's my post, get, and delete over here. Right, so again, I'm pulling this definition right from Swagger Hub. There's actually a, a built-in integration that lets you pull things in very, very easily. And you can see over here, I've built out responses. And I mentioned that dispatch style. I'm responding sequentially. That's going to make my life easier for, our, for the demo that I'm going to show when we get to SOAP UI. Uh, but there's multiple different dispatch styles and maybe to build a pretty comprehensive virtual service, I may use parameters or run a script or query match, right? To help me, um, again, make it more interactive in a realistic way. Now you can see that all of my responses here, they're all different examples of a 200 response. Uh, and we're gonna use these to talk about contract validation and testing. So let's go into SOAP UI. Hopefully uh, that's a very quick overview of Service V. You can do a lot. Things I'm not talking about, but it can do are data driving, pull, pulling from a data source. Uh, you can do inbound validation. Uh, you can also do behavioral simulation, uh, like an underpowered server. And there's, of course, audit logs and things like that that you can leverage. But for what we need to know right now, again, making a dynamic version of our API to help us understand examples, which is very important for the design process. Again, the reason being that we want to reduce the cost of changes. So by having this interactive service, we can understand what it looks like. And then if we need to make changes, do it very cheaply. So we're in SOAP UI um, to transition away from Service V now. And the reason that we want to look at SOAP UI is because it's a functional testing tool and it can it's a very robust tool. It can do a lot. Uh, but we're going to look at it from a very, very simple use case, relatively simple use case, which is contract validation and API testing. So um, did I build the right thing, right? Or did I build it correctly? Maybe it's a better way uh, to pull from Ali's talk. Um, and this is a question that's been coming up a lot for us is, uh, so I built a design, then my dev team built an implementation. Now, how do I verify that the implementation matched the design? And this is an example of how to do that using SOAP UI. So what I'm going to do is send a, re send a request to my virtual service. By the way, I set up my virtual service to run in the cloud. So this is um, the, the endpoint for that virtual service. I'm just setting that up to AWS and then running it there. So I'm going to run my test. And you can see that my test is failing. 
So I've added two assertions down here. In one assertion, it's called contract validation, the other functional validation. Contract validation is simply looking at, is this the right contract, right? Did you include the right structure? Functional validation is looking at, is it working the way you expect it to work? So let's look at my response over here. You can see that my manufacturer has this phone number parameter inside it. And if we go back to my design, we'll click on manufacturer. You can see that the parameter is supposed to be called phone. So this is an example of contract validation. And what it's doing is it's telling me that, um, let's go back here. You know, I've made as a developer, let's assume I'm the developer in this case, I've made a very simple mistake, very easy to, to easy mistake to make, which is I've called the parameter phone number when it should just be phone, right? So catching these types of um, mistakes is what we're trying to do with contract testing. So let's send this request again. Now let's pretend I went back and changed my parameter to say phone, which I've done. Um, but even though my contract's valid, you'll notice that I'm still failing my test. And the reason I'm failing this test is because I have parentheses in the area code for my phone number. So this is illuminating a, uh, a reason why we need to have this idea of creating examples and example mapping and talking about the design. Because what we clearly didn't talk about here is what does a valid phone number look like? Will our users put parentheses around the area code? Uh, now in this case, our developers decided, yes, they will. Clearly we're returning a response with parentheses in it. Uh, but maybe the people who are building the client are saying, no, we have a reason that we can't accept parentheses. So enabling these types of conversations is what we're trying to do by using these virtual services very early in our uh, development process. And it also illustrates the importance of functional testing, not just looking at the contract, but looking at what's actually coming back. Is it working the right way? Now, in our case, because our client has decided, or our client um, development team has decided that we do need to have a restriction such that we can't allow parentheses, my backend team will go and fix that. And we can run our test again. And now we can see everything passes. So that's just an introduction to the ideas, the concepts that we're trying to um, facilitate here. And ideally, I wouldn't be doing this manually. Ideally, I would have this running in CI. Um, what I would do is be using exporting these tests, running something like a GitHub action, been playing around with GitHub Actions in the last week and learning a bit about those. Those can be really useful. Spin up a virtual environment, execute these tests from that, and then tear it down after it's done. Kill a build or kill a deployment um, or a pull request if those tests don't pass. So it's that real-time feedback that we get from the automation and then leveraging these concepts of design to build all of the assets we need to enable that kind of real-time feedback, that automated feedback. All right, and I think I have about five minutes left. So hopefully, um, despite my technical issues that I've been having consistently for the last 45 minutes, hopefully uh, everyone was able to take something away from this. Um, and if you have any questions or want to reach out after, please feel free to do so. Um, stop sharing now just to kind of minimize my resources. Thank you again for um, attending. Uh, again, the Q&A is open. So if you do have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them there. Um, but in the meantime, I guess if not, thank you very much. Appreciate the time. And if I don't see any questions, I guess I'll I'll end this session a little bit early. All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care.